As we were told centuries ago by the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, today God fulfilled his promise to baptize his followers in the Holy Spirit. Let us pray together to praise him for his gift of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, you've called us together today, just as you called your apostles together on the 49th day after Easter. Don't let us be separated by the physical space between us. Bring us together in one place as members of Christ's church. As on that day, reveal yourself to us as the Holy Spirit so that we can bask in your glory today as the apostles did on that day. Let us experience the signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit. Let us see the glory of the Holy Spirit. Let us feel the wind at our backs. Let us hear the word of God in a way that we understand. And as we hear the word of God, wrap us in the Holy Spirit. Let us be enlivened by the Holy Spirit. Inspire us to share the word of God. Call others to us so that they too might be struck with awe and wonder at the Holy Spirit. Give us the words we need to bring them to you. Help us share the word of God in the language they can hear and they can understand, so that they too will seek you out and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In God's name we pray. Amen. Hello, First Presbyterian children and families. Today I'm going to read you a story from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And, if, and some of you have this book at home, and if you do, this story is on page 326, and it's called God Sends Help. God Sends Help. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in a stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed. The door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus told them. I'm going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So there they were waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was just being scared and hiding. You can't blame them. Their best friend had left. The important people and leaders were after them. And Jesus had given them a job they didn't know how to do. As they waited, they were praying and remembering, remembering how from the beginning, God had been working out his secret rescue plan. Suddenly, a strong wind filled the little room, whistling through the walls, rustling the straw on the floor, and there on everyone's heads, shining in the gloom were flickering flames fire that didn't hurt or burn. And something more inside their hearts, they felt a strange heat, almost as if a coldness and hardness were melting away, as if their broken hearts were mending and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly. How it happened, they didn't know, but they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze and Jesus himself was coming to live inside them. They had seen Jesus go away, but now he was closer than he had ever been inside their hearts. And this time, nothing could ever separate them Jesus would always be there with them, loving them, whispering the promise that would get rid of the poison and the terrible lie and the sickness in their hearts. God's wonderful promise to them, you are my child and I love you. Make your home in me as I make my home in you, Jesus had said. Could it be? Heaven was coming into their hearts. They threw open the shutters. Sunlight flooded the room as love flooded their hearts. 
and the little room was filled with happy noises, dancing feet, singing, laughing. They unlocked the door and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice so everyone could hear. Jesus died for you, he said, because he loves you. But God made him alive again. He has rescued you. People stopped and listened. The words sank down deep into their hearts and worked like a medicine that makes you well. Like the antidote to a deadly poison. Like a kiss that wakes you from a deep sleep. Stop running away from God, Peter said. Run to him instead so he can love you and make you free. And Peter told them the wonderful story of God's love. God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And Jesus had come. All that had happened. There were lots of people from faraway countries in Jerusalem. They couldn't speak the same language, but as they listened to Peter, everyone could understand what he was saying in their own languages. Many people believed and became Jesus's new friends and helpers. And the wonderful news of Jesus spread like sparks from a fire to villages, towns, cities. Every day, more and more people believed. And so it was that the family of God's children, his special people, grew. One man was watching. I'll stop this, Saul said. But this was God's plan and nothing in the world would ever stop it. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with, be with you. you. As the Father has sent me, so Peace I send you. Be when he said this, you. he breathed on them and said to them, Receive, Receive the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Thank you. In today's scripture passage, the disciples are gathered in the upper room, and the door is shut. The door is locked. They are afraid to go outside, and who knows how long it's been since the last time they actually went outside. That should sound just a little bit familiar to some of us today. Though the door is locked, Jesus is about to make his big post-resurrection entrance. And this is where I think he missed a truly great opportunity. Let me tell you how Jesus should have entered the building. Knock, knock. Who's there? Theodore. The uh, door is locked. Do you want to open it? Knock, knock. Who's there? Candice. Candice who? Can this door open or what? Knock, knock. Who's there? Doris. Doris who? Doris locked. That's why I've been knocking. Knock, knock. Who's there? Ben. Ben who? Been knocking for a really long time now. Knock, knock. Who's there? Howie. Howie who? How are we going to finish this story if you don't let me come in? Knock, knock. Who's there? Dolores. 
Dolores who? Dolores, my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in great... Oh! Hey, Jesus, it's you! Come on in! You see, if Jesus had done that, that would have been a truly epic entrance. Unfortunately, Jesus didn't go that route. Instead, he just came straight through the locked door, surprised his friends, who up until this point had thought that he was dead, and said to them, Peace be with you. In the NIV translation, the very next verse reads, And the disciples soiled their undergarments and screamed like little girls. I'm just kidding. That's not actually in the Bible. But I bet that's exactly how it happened. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. The version of the Pentecost story that most people are familiar with, the one that we just heard Miss Marina read to us, that story comes from the book of Acts. And in that version of the story, the Holy Spirit comes 50 days after Jesus ascends up into heaven. That version of the story, Pentecost happens outside in the marketplace with tongues of fire descending from the heavens onto the heads of the disciples. And that's why we associate Pentecost with flames and the color red. But this year, we are going with a different version of the story. There's another version of that same story that appears in the Gospel of John, today's scripture reading. And that version is a little more understated, a little more intimate. And the focus is on breath more than fire. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto his disciples. Yes, you heard that right. Jesus breathes on his disciples. You see, he's recently been out of the country and now he comes uninvited into a house crowded with people. He does not observe social distancing. He's not wearing a mask. And he does the one thing that we are trying really hard not to do to each other right now. The reason that we are all wearing masks when we go outside. And that's because bad, bad things come from breath and breathing. Things like viruses that can make you sick and possibly kill you. Way to be an example, Jesus. Of course, all this takes place in an entirely different context from our own, where coronavirus does not yet exist. And in fact, where Christianity does not exist. Because you see, Pentecost, this occasion, is considered the birthday, the origin of the Christian church. And so today, on this 2,000 and something plus anniversary of the birth of the church, while most of us are locked safely in our homes, just like the disciples were, and perhaps just a little bit afraid for our lives, I want to invite you all to do something that you might not have done for a while. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a while, and then slowly let it out. Keep doing that a few times as you're listening. Did you know that the Greek word for Holy Spirit in this passage and everywhere it occurs in the New Testament is pneuma hagion, which literally translates to holy breath or holy wind. And in the Old Testament, in ancient Hebrew, the word for spirit, specifically God's spirit, is ruach, which even has a breathy sound to it. And that is also translated as breath or wind. So God's spirit is God's breath. And that makes a lot of sense because to most ancient peoples, breath was not something to be feared. Breath was life itself. The one thing above all others that distinguished the living from the dead. While you were alive, you breathe. And when you stop being alive, you stop breathing. Think about it this way too. When you breathe in, you are literally taking something from the world inside of yourself. Yes, sometimes it's a nasty virus, 
But sometimes it's a breath of fresh mountain air or the smell of cookies baking in the oven. Likewise, when you exhale or breathe out, something of you leaves you and goes out into the world. And lately, we've been really worried about that. But let's remember that the list of things going out into the world on our breath also includes our speech. So every time you've ever said, I love you to someone, or someone has said that to you, every song you've ever sung, or every song that has ever been sung to you, including your mother's lullabies, every one of those things has been carried out into the world on the wings of a breath. So breath is life, is spirit. Jesus, who was dead, but is now alive again, gives one last gift to his disciples. He breathes on them. He gives them his breath, his life, his spirit. And there is a beautiful metaphor in that as well. Because just as he had drawn them into himself at the beginning of his earthly ministry, breathe in. Now he sends them out in his name. Breathe out. The disciples of Jesus have figuratively become his breath, his life, his spirit, and they are exhaled into the world. And so are we, metaphorically and sometimes quite literally. This week, many El Pasoans have been or will be cautiously wandering out of their doors for the first time in quite a while. Little by little, hopefully using common sense and courtesy, and hopefully not all at once, but it is beginning to happen. I know for some that's exciting, and for others it's absolutely terrifying. I do think that people in each of those groups would do well to listen carefully to each other, to try to understand and respect the different circumstances and the different contexts that sometimes lead us on understandably different paths. And speaking of paths, that's of course where the metaphorical sense comes in. Here at First Presbyterian Church, we like to think of ourselves as a church for wanderers, wanderers, and wisdom seekers. But all of those things are difficult to do when you are stuck, metaphorically speaking, in a spiritual rut, locked up in the nice imaginary rooms in your mind of habit or comfort or security, afraid to strike out on the kind of faith journey, the kind of spiritual adventure that actually gives life meaning and purpose, exactly the kind that Jesus is talking about when he tells his disciples and us that just as the Father has sent me, now I send you. Look, every time you open the door and step out into the world, literally or metaphorically, there will be risks and dangers. The very first thing that Jesus does when he greets his disciples in this scripture passage is he shows them the scars and the wounds in his hand and side, the wounds that his own journey through life inflicted upon him. Venturing out into the world will hurt you emotionally, physically, spiritually. You might even get crucified. But there is also danger in never opening the door, never answering the call of God's Spirit, never taking the first step on the road that God has prepared for you. Because in the end, there isn't much difference between death and a life that is never lived. So I think the trick for us, and it really is difficult, is in the balance. We don't just rush headlong through the open door recklessly just for the sake of being on some sort of journey itself. Instead, and especially as Presbyterians and intellectuals, we do so thoughtfully, calmly and rationally, but purposefully and always mindful 
that we walk with others on that same path. In fact, you can recognize the call of God's Spirit because it's almost always a call to help other people on that path. There's one more thing that Jesus tells his disciples to do before they open the door and step out into the world, and that is forgive people. Verse 23 says, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven by God. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained by God. Only the words by God aren't really in that passage. I just added them there because that is kind of what we think when we think through this passage. Surely only God has the power to forgive or retain sins. But we could just as easily read this verse as, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven by you yourself. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained by you yourself. In other words, how much baggage do you want to carry with you on your journey? Do you want to carry around the weight of all the people who have wronged you, hurt you, insulted you, disagreed with you, or argued with you just in the past week? Or would you rather let it go and walk out that door with nothing on your shoulders? Try it sometime. As you're getting ready to leave your house, stop. Forgive someone. Let something go. So, to recap all of that, breathe in, breathe out. Follow the Spirit and forgive each other. May your journeys be long and may they take you far. Oh, and knock, knock. Let us. Let us who? Let us pray. Lord, it is difficult to speak of breath and breathing. In a week where one of your children, a man named George Floyd, was deprived of his ability to breathe and died in the custody of police officers, those whom we look to as protectors of life. Lord, in the anger and protests that followed in so many places just two nights ago, another one of your children, this time a police officer who was protecting others, a man named Patrick Underwood, was also killed. Lord, hear our prayer for the families and loved ones of both of these men. Lord, hear our prayer for our country and the high ideals that we are supposed to represent but so often fail to. Lord, help us use the breath that you have given us to speak up when we see injustice happening, to speak up when we see someone being treated cruelly and unfairly. Help us to use that very same breath to speak out against the cycle of violence and retribution. Lord, when you came to your disciples on Pentecost, twice you said to them, peace be with you. And oh, how we long for that peace in our world today. And yet, Lord, we know that you are calling us to work for that peace, to be your hands and feet and your voice, to be your agents of peace in our communities. And Lord, it is difficult work. So fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your zeal for justice. Fill us with love and compassion for all of your children of every race, every station, and every vocation. Through your spirit and our spirit-filled works, may your peace come quickly, Lord, upon this earth. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 